Japanese invasion and occupation of Wandong through 1937 and 45 was another bitter experience. The home villages were bombed, they were occupied, they were harassed. Here in Guangzhou City, of course, the Japanese were a cruel and oppressive occupation force. All contact with the mayor of New Zealand was cut off for the duration of the flow of remittances, of course, stopped as well. There was another side to it, though. In New Zealand, having a common enemy drew the New Zealand wider community and the Chinese together for the first time, bound up in a common cause with a common enemy and the obligation to raise money and do things in support of the war effort, together. In the early 1940s, a small boy from this village went with his mother to join his father in New Zealand. He was a bright wee fellow, did well at school, went on to university, qualified as a doctor, became one of that first generation of really assimilated New Zealand Chinese. But in his middle years, he became fascinated by what had been left behind, the culture and the history of his people in New Zealand. He began to dig through the archives and after years and years of investigation, he wrote a magnum opus, Windows on a Chinese Past. Our whole project is based on that work, so it's absolutely incredible to come here and think about that little boy, Dr. Jim Ning. Here we are at Shane Moo High School, which is kind of famous in these parts as having been built originally with remittances from Toy Sinese overseas. Now Jim Ling's father went to this school in the 1910s and the part that he actually went to doesn't exist now, it's been redeveloped. But this section here is probably going back to that early period. And it shows the importance to Toy San and the villages around here of all that money coming back from overseas. It was the basis of the prosperity of these parts and creating amenities like this school that would give local children a real hands up and many of them, of course, would then follow the path overseas. Jim's grandfather left this village in 1878 when he was just 12. His father left in 1917, age 17. And through their hard work in New Zealand and the money they sent home, they developed quite a family portfolio in the area. They erected this house, a fine home with two wings, they erected a keep to help protect the village from the bandits that were prevalent in this area, and they had the shop in Shane Moo, the nearby market town. And that was kind of typical of the overseas Chinese and the remittances they sent back to build up their home villages. But from the late 1930s, things began to change, and instead of being sojourners just going away and coming back and investing all their efforts home, the overseas Chinese often began to settle down in the overseas destinations, and the flow of money stopped and the villages went into decline. Uh, Japanese came in after that rampant inflation <laughs> and uh, the communists came in and so with uh, the people here also gave up their sojourner thoughts uh, because our villages were being devastated. So this is Shane Mu, which was the old market town for Wing Lung village. And the Nings from their hard work in New Zealand owned a shop in this market town. When Jim Ning came back here in 1985, the first to visit since communist revolution, the family still actually owned the shop. It was here. Now it's since been demolished and replaced with a modern building. No longer a shop either, it's a family home. But the lady who still lives there, also a Ning. So there's a bit of continuity there. The Japanese came into our county in 1941 and then they were beaten back. After that incursion by the Japanese, uh, our family fled to Hong Kong uh, and the Japanese came back again and, and conquered the uh, county. Um, we also left Hong Kong just before the Japanese uh, took Hong Kong. So we were lucky and we arrived here, in, I think about July or August um, 1941. Jim's mother was one of a number of Chinese females who was allowed temporary entry to New Zealand as a refugee so that families could be reunited. His father was operating a laundry in Gore at the time. 
This added a new dynamic that had been lacking in the Otago Chinese community, females. The reunification of families created a baby boom for New Zealand Chinese, an obvious silver lining to the dark clouds of war. My mother came out as a war refugee in 1940, and the war refugees were um, more or less uh, inspired by the men that were already in New Zealand. They went to the Presbyterian Church because they were the backbone of the Chinese um, society because they were very supportive. And the Chinese groups petitioned, the government said, well, war is taking place in South China. We've got wives and family there. Maybe you should allow these people to come out to New Zealand to be out of harm's way. And the government um, said, yes, we'll do it on compassionate grounds. Wives and family can come out for two years, but the men will have to pay a £200 bond and also sign a surety of £500 so that these women and children will go back to China after two years. But the um, war went on and on and because the destruction in China was so bad, going back to China would be extremely difficult. And the Presbyterian Church and the national churches got together, spoke to the government and said, well, these people are here now. The Chinese have served as well during the war. They raised funds for the war effort. The men were producing the food crops for New Zealand and the troops during the war. And the refugee women were volunteering for the Red Cross and they put their efforts in. So it's about time that you showed some compassion. And the New Zealand government talked about Chinese as our brave allies and not the yellow peril and said, yes, we will grant them permanent residency. We, they refunded the 200 pounds, which they charged, and uh, that was the foundation of the modern Chinese society as we've got today. Obviously, not all of the families were lucky enough to escape to New Zealand. One famous family with strong Otago links, the Suhoys, were kept apart by war for many years. Like many of the New Zealand Chinese families, the Suhoys maintained bases back here in Guangdong, the home village. Business enterprises here in the Wangsha district of Guangzhou as well. Both of Choi Suhoi's Chinese born sons, Kum Poi and Kum Yok, came out to New Zealand and worked there with him. Kum Yok then came home. He operated the business here, which was a timber yard and general merchants. Now, his son, Hugh, in due course, was sent out to New Zealand in 1920 for the first time as a young man. But he didn't really get on with his uncle Kum Poi in Dunedin, so after a few years he came back here and went into the business with his dad here in Guangzhou. Now his father eventually retired, his brothers left to go elsewhere, and he was left in charge of the Guangzhou operation. He married, he had a family. He had always meant to go back to Dunedin, but you know he didn't really get round to it. But then of course, in the late 1930s, there came that Japanese threat, and all of a sudden he realised that his family wasn't safe here. So he sent them back to Shere Kong, to the home village. He went out to Dunedin to prepare a bolt hole for them. He organised the permits that would see his wife and children come to join him, but before they could, the Japanese invaded up at Pernyu and they had to take off. When he came here, he managed to get permit for us to come, but mum refused to come because at that time, virtually, he, we had to go right from uh, Guangzhou, Canton, through the territory where Japanese you know, what they held, and have to go right through to India, and then from India, then so it's too much, too risk to take. So mum said, no, I'm not going to risk the, the, the lives or not. So that's why we, we were a state behind in, in China. Hu and Dunedin had no idea what was happening with them. Throughout the next whole six years of the war period, all he got was one message, and all it said was safe. It was down to Fanny, his wife, to look after the children and evade the Japanese, which she did. And then finally, in 1946, those permits were used, the family travelled to Dunedin, and what a joyful reunion that was, the family all together in Dunedin for the first time. Despite the relief for many Chinese on reaching New Zealand, there was also much anxiety for those still left at home. News was scarce, and messages difficult to get through. The mail, of course, uh, uh, was uh, interrupted. Um, 
some families nearer to Canton uh, and Macau uh, got messages back uh, through the Red Cross, but they were often just cryptic uh, uh, messages like, uh, we're all right, or that kind of thing. The reality was, Guangdong was suffering terribly. The Japanese occupation forces were very oppressive and at times extremely cruel. That was very hard. Um, that was when the Japanese had started to raid the villages as well. They needed food for their troops, so they took the rice. For the villagers, food was a major concern during the Japanese occupation. There was no, no rice to eat. They had to live off potatoes, which they hated. They had corn, which they tried to eat. There was corn flour, which was mixed up with rice flour. And I think they baked it with a little bit of salt. And that became the hard cake biscuits, which they had a good storage life, and they could wet them and eat them. And they ate field mice as a form of food. And one day, uh, a Japanese soldier with a gun on his back, walking past, grabbed a pack of cigarettes and walked with a panger. I ran him after him, yelling, you haven't paid for the pack of cigarette. And all the bystanders, all the Chinese, don't, oh, be careful, be careful, don't shout that, because he couldn't run to shoot me. But I just so young, I was so, <laughs> I, I, go, I don't care if I just yell at him, chase him, but he just kept walking. So outside the school, where my father was involved in, there was, a, Japanese, uh, there was a, a tuck shop, so to speak, where they sold food to the students and this shopkeeper refused to serve Japanese and he got taken outside and executed, got his head chopped off. That's how bad it was then. In case the chap caught them, the woman scared them or raped them and t take their jewelry and the youth was scared they might take them away to, to do hard labour and all that. So the uh, Guangzhou Kowloon Railway passes through southern Zhongxing and this was the way that many of the Zhongxing families made their way from the villages around here to Hong Kong and on to New Zealand. It was the same route that refugees from the Japanese took when they fled in the late 1930s heading down again to Hong Kong and on the way to New Zealand. The Zhongxing villages of Sa Tau and Gualeng were particularly vulnerable to attack prior to occupation because of their proximity to the only railway line that linked Guangzhou to Hong Kong. This meant constant air raids and danger for the villagers. They bombed the railway so often. Uh, they can make a few trips a day to bomb you. Drop the two or three bombs in the way again and you only can re do the repair after the Japanese plane's gone otherwise the, they say, uh, say a group of people the machine can you the Japanese took over the tower and one night the villagers thought, well, we've had enough of this. They put hay and uh, wood outside the tower and set fire to it and burnt them all inside. They couldn't get out. So they did rebel, but they waited for the right moment. They couldn't, they had no guns to fight them, but uh, they did get their own back. Back in Dunedin, the Chinese found that they'd become more socially accepted because of the war. The arrival of females and the appearance of children meant that a community evolved. In a time of global adversity, the Chinese finally began to feel at home in Dunedin. The Chinese were accepted in the 1940s because um, food was difficult to get 
and it was food rationing. And because um, food was difficult, there was an issue of coupons that there was butter and bread and milk and cheese. And you had to have a coupon but, or the grocer couldn't sell it to you. Well, Chinese had no need for cheese and butter and milk. They more uh, required rice. So the local housewives knew that my mother would be interested in the rice coupons and my mother would in turn give the, her, the other women the um, milk coupons and of course the pieces of uh, orange uh, that my father brought home and we ever got on very well because um, we shared. Yeah, the Chinese became regarded as allies and um, there's still a hidden uh, history of how the Chinese responded but they, uh, the government regarded them uh, Peter Fraser and others regarded them as uh, being good citizens uh, during that war. And afterwards, uh, it turned that um, the Chinese were uh, being thought of as uh, still only a small uh, minority. In 1950, uh, I think the population was still only about 5,000. And, and so they the, the feeling was that um, the Chinese should settle here. Why not settle here? Um, the communists have come in and the Chinese agree. At the beginning of the, of the war, that was, that was really when the New Zealand government started to realise that the Chinese were actually kind of on, on their side, as it were, because they had been fighting the Japanese or had been persecuted by the Japanese. The Japanese invasion of Guangdong was a horrible experience for the Chinese. Today we are fortunate that a large collection of photographs taken by missionaries in the province are looked after by Presbyterian archives at Knox College in Dunedin. They catalogue the many hardships endured by those left behind. The positive side of this was that in Dunedin, Chinese were now accepted as part of general society. A community had developed and from this community emerged battlers who would rise to become some of the most powerful people in the city.